the solution is the, we have a Jewish state, namely Israel, and a Palestinian state, which is to be newly created, i.e. we don't have a Palestinian state yet. And that these two states are going to live side by side in peace and security. Uh, East Jerusalem being the Palestinian capital, that's what international law has, has repeated, said, stated repeatedly. But anyway, that's the whole idea, the two-state solution. Uh, and this is the default, quote-unquote, solution of the international community to the, quote-unquote, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to start off with the history of the two-state solution and also the history of Palestine in general. And I, I'd like to do that. I, I'm sure I'm talking, preaching to the converted. Uh, forgive me if all of you know all of this stuff. But, um, you know, I, I'm always constantly surprised at how many people, even, you know, within the international human rights community, who think that somehow, you know, okay, we have this land of Palestine, we have this, this land, whatever it's called, and, uh, you know, that the Jewish people and the Palestinians have lived, lived there for, you know, time immemorial, uh, lived side by side for millennia, and yet somehow, they can't get along and somehow can't agree to share the land. And therefore, we have to split the land in two, and that's the only way that we can you know, make peace. I'm always constantly surprised at how many people honestly believe this. And it's, 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 um, you know, it's really important to understand you know, the history of how this all came about and what's, you know, what, what this is about uh, to really see uh, you know, the truth of Palestine and of the two-state solution. So I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about history, and certainly not ancient history. Um, but I just, this is just a very brief overview of uh, the Roman times. And, you know, of course, we don't, uh, we didn't have Facebook at the time, so there's a lot uh, um, that remains undocumented. But certainly the Israeli narrative about the Roman era is that, you know, we had this, they had this you know, huge kingdom of, of, of Israel. Judea and Samaria, as they like to call it, and the kingdom of you know the, the Jewish kingdom was uh, fighting valiantly against the Romans, but the Romans, with their overwhelming power, finally won, and they destroyed the temple and expelled all the Jews from Palestine. This is what the Israeli narrative is, and, and um, you know Jewish people all over the world in the diaspora, like in the, in the, in the Western world, you know, they, people learn this as as, as established fact. Um, you'd be very surprised. Now, um, you know, archaeology is very much a weapon in, in Palestine, uh, certainly an Israeli weapon. And, you know, the Israelis have, have used uh, archaeology and, and the research of history in a very arbitrary way to sort of get pushed forward their narrative. The facts are, uh, as far as we know, is that it's really not clear that the Second Temple, um, which is, you know, they say it was right under uh, where Al-Aqsa is, that you know, that it's not clear that it existed where Israel says it's not even clear that it existed at all. We don't really know about this. Um, the other thing is that it was. It does appear that Jews were expelled from Jerusalem. It's very unclear whether they were expelled from the rest of Palestine. We don't really know this. And even if that were the case, you know, it wouldn't be the kind of thing that could have been enforced in any case. I mean, it's not like you know the Romans had power up to the borders of Palestine. And all this is. All these kind of mythical, sort of imaginative, imagine, you know, imaginative um, notions come from this idea that we all have now, from thinking of a modern nation state where everybody has identity documents and passports, and there are clear borders. And, you know, when you fly into a place, you show them your passport, and all this kind of this kind of thing existed. So, it really wouldn't have been uh, enforceable. But what is clear is that a lot of you know quite a large proportion of Jewish people um, moved from Palestine to all sorts of different places. They moved to um, Africa, to what is to Persia, what is now Iran, of course, and you know other places in West Asia. And a lot of them also moved to Europe. And that's where the problems uh, started. I mean, you know, many Jewish people stayed in Palestine, and many of them, you know, over the over the millennia, just sort of lost their kind of Jewish faith and their Jewish identity. And the same with some of the other communities, where the other communities managed to sort of preserve their faith. But it really was in Europe where the problems arise. And 
The other thing is that it's, it's important to, you know, to stress that the Jewish people that eventually ended up in Europe were not the same people that left Palestine. I mean, it took you know, it took we don't know you know the great the details in great length, but um, it, it would have taken you know, many many decades, even centuries, for this sort of migration to take place. And Judaism at the time it was a religion, just like Islam, just like Christianity. You know, they would they would preach the religion of Judaism, and you could become a believer in Judaism, and they were a Jew, and that means that simple. And you know, in our holy book, the, the Holy Quran, they, they you know talk about the Jewish tribes and how they were betrayed, you know, how the, the you know how the first Muslims were betrayed by the Jews and all this kind of thing. I mean, these were basically Arabs, Arabs who had converted to Judaism. But so what you know what happened was the Judaism spread to certain communities on the way I think it was at some you know part of uh, sort of uh, Central Asia and then Central Europe Slavic people and all that kind of thing and those are the people who migrated to Europe later on so when we think of you know when Europeans think of Jewish people you know that's the people that they're thinking about it's it's you know we've all seen these the caricatures that the Europeans used to draw about Jews about you know, dark hair and dark eyes and short and sort of plump and you know long nose and this kind of thing you know this isn't what they look like in Palestine I mean, this is you know these are different people but in the course of being persecuted in Europe what happened was that the Jewish people were racialized we use this word in academia they were racialized it became um, Judy, Jews became uh, transferred from, or tra uh, transformed from being a religion to being a people, to being an ethnic group. So you were born a Jew, and no matter what you did, your blood was a Jew. I mean, you you were you you were of Jewish blood, and you could not you know convert to Christianity and, and forget it all. No, you, this was just this was just who you are. It was your identity. It was like your ethnic. It was your ethnicity. Yeah. You know, Taking sort of centuries of all this persecution and all right, making it very um, simplifying, but that overall, that's basically what happened. So Jews Jew became racialized, and they became the target of persecution in Europe. And in response to that, we saw you know, Zionism, which was made really at the end of the 19th century, and this was a movement to create a Jewish country. Uh, you know, and the, this the, the movement of Zionism was. It was created in Central and Eastern Europe. All, all the first texts, these were written like in German, or you know, sometimes even in Hungarian. You know, these debates they took place in places like Bern in Switzerland. You know, all of these debates they're taking place amongst European European Jews educated in Europe to, uh, and and you know in European languages. So it was a very European um, European philosophy. Uh, the whole Zionism is. Basically, modeled on European national and imperialism. You know, they're, they're, the idea was we're we're originally, where our ancestors are originally from Palestine. So we're going to go back and we're going to reclaim the land for ourselves. And this is very clear. If you read the sort of first text of, of Zionism, it is it is very clear. And they, they weren't dumb. They knew that you know, there were people living there. The Palestinians were there. The you know Arab people were living. There. But they weren't, you know, they didn't count. I mean, just in the same way that, you know, Europeans at the time, to them, Asians, Africans, you know, they're just like, they're just savages, you know, we're going to go, we're going to take their land, we're going to take their resources, maybe we'll convert them to Christianity, and, you know, they'll actually thank us, they'll actually be grateful for us. It was the same attitude, really the same attitude, that they were going to go and colonize Palestine, and, uh, you know, the, the locals would actually be grateful for us to us for bringing Western civilization. You know, these people, they're just savages. You know, what do they know? That was really the idea. And so Zionism was really this European nationalism movement. So Zionism aims at the Jewish, you know, it's always aimed at the colonization of Palestine. That's very clear. That's why, um, you know, I always have, I always am a little bit upset when people just sort of call this, the Israel-Palestine conflict. Yes, it's a conflict. Right? Yeah, in, 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 legally speaking, it's, it's an armed conflict in, 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 you know, in, in very, very strict terms. But you know, that doesn't begin to sort of depict what's really happening 
this is a colonization of other people's life. I mean, that's very, that's very, very clear. And if you read the, you know, the beginning texts of Zionism and all this stuff that they agree used to write it, and this philosophy with what they used to write, then they just know bones about it. And this, they use words like colonies. I mean, it's very, very clear. The Israeli government now, they will, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go crazy with these words. And, and that's why you never see them in the so-called international media. But in the, in the beginning, it was very, very clear. We're going to go, we colonize, we create colonizers, you know, we create colonies and we put our people there. That's what it was all about. Now, at the beginning, uh, it, was, it was much more low key. It was actually sort of innocuous. This was during the time that Palestine was being ruled by the Ottomans. But more and more, and this is especially in the beginning of the 20th century, it started becoming more belligerent and more overtly aimed at driving Palestinians off. Their land. So, you know, we have uh, Zionist colonizers. And remember, they're coming from Europe. These are completely different people, ethnically. You know, they're, they're, they're from Central Europe. They're white. Some of them are blonde and blue eyed. These are completely different people from the Jewish people who left Palestine, you know, many, many millennia ago. Um, so, you know, they, they, they have no connection, not even ethnically. Most of them don't have any kind of connection with people who left. But you know, they have the through the sort of maintenance of their religious faith, they they believe that they have a claim to this land. So they're coming, so they're colonizing it, and they're doing things like buying uh, Palestinian farms, promising that they'll let Palestinians work and you know stay on the farmland and, and toil the soil. And, and then you know, once they buy the farms, they're kicking everybody out. So no, we're only going to allow Jewish people to work. Things like that, and it gets more and more over, more and more. Uh, problematic. And this leads, of course, to more tensions. And you know, I've used the word conflict here, but it, it gets more and more sort of uh, the whole situation gets more and more tense. Now, after World War One, of course, the Brits came and they had the mandate to, to take over, to run Palestine. And the British, had, at, at the beginning, in, in for sure, overtly support the Zionists. And uh, you know, this has to do with the Balfour Declaration and all that. But the point is, they allowed them to create uh, armed militia to carry weapons, terrorize Palestinians, and all that. So all of this was really done, um, certainly in the early stages, with the active participation uh, of the Brits. Now, World War II, uh, of course, the Holocaust, uh, or at least after the Holocaust, has also resulted in increasing uh, Zionist migration to Palestine. This is where we're going to get to the maps here. Um, and the UK, uh, though being on the winning side, basically is completely exhausted. It doesn't have the uh, ability, the capacity to maintain its, its colonies and its empire. So, and you know, everything is blowing up in its face, and we're not going to deal with this anymore. So, the UK says, we're going to leave. And we're going to hand the file to the UN. I'm, I'm oversimplifying a lot of things here. But this is basically what happened. So it hands the file to the United Nations, which had been created, uh, you know, which had just sort of got off the ground. This was the first big international issue that the United Nations was looking at and had been you know, charged with. And it was the first major thing. You know, they failed it miserably. So if you look, what happened was um, the UN uh, discussed what was going on. There are all these sort of fact-finding commissions and fact-finding commissions that were ignored and you know, all those kind of things. But at the end, in late 47, the UN adopted the partition resolution. This is, um, this is where we look at the maps. So the reality was the map on the left, where Palestine, this is what Palestine looked like at the time. Right? Palestinians owned 93% of the land, basically everything. And two thirds of the population was Palestinian, not uh, the Zionists. Um, even this was, you know, had, had been majorly, there had been a major increase in Zionists over the recent years, right after World War II. So, you know, uh, that, that was also a reason. But at that point, it was about two thirds of the population. And yet, so the UN prances in and said, okay, we got a great idea. Since you guys can't, don't, it doesn't seem like you guys can get along. Why don't you Palestinians, why don't you give up half your country to these foreign colonizers? And then, you know, everything's going to be fine. So, you know, if you're a Palestinian, you're looking at this, well, wait a minute, what's going on? 
we, you know, we own this practically this entire country. There are these foreigners coming in with the support of the colonial power. Uh, they've been, you know, they've been messing around. They've been taking our land, often through very sort of dodgy and various means. They've been doing all these things to drive us out. And here the United Nations coming and saying, oh, why don't you just give up half of your land to these people? I mean, then everything will be fine. No, that's not fine. So this is a clear injustice. This is already the international community is, has failed Palestinians miserably. But, and yet, this is the beginning of the two-state solution, basically, in international relation to international. This is the two-state solution, the beginning of the two-state solution. And it remains the default option for the international community. The international, when they're talking about the two-state solution, this is what they're, they're, they're always going back. Um, and then, you know, right after that, you have the Nakba, and then Israel took more than it had been allotted to for the Jewish state for the partition resolution. The, 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 the map on the right, which sort of unhelpfully said 1967, um, and I'll tell you why in a second, is, is, um, is basically, if you look at the white, sort of light gray, this is what Israel, the Zionists, took in 1940. So already they've taken more than what they were allotted in the middle map. All right? Already they're taking more than what the UN said, uh, sort of, okay, well, maybe why don't we sort of cordon this off at for a Jewish state? So that's what happened in 1948 and 67, um, then they occupied the rest. So basically, when you look at the map on the right, you have uh, the green part, which is, the green part was, has also been occupied by the Israel. Um, in, this, is, this went on, and then we had the first Intifada, and then in Oslo, the PLO accepted the create, basically accepted the two-state solution. They accepted the creation of the Palestinian state on the green part in the right, the map on the right hand side. So that's 22% of the mandate powers. And you know, I want to, I think it's important, you know, to compare this map on the right, not only with the map in the middle, but with the map on the left. Because remember, this is what Palestine, the one on the left, this is what Palestine, this is the reality, this is what Palestine looks like. And yet, so you, and yet, because of the overwhelming might of the Israeli military machine, and the continuing support by you know, the Western countries, the powers, basically you have the PLO saying, okay, look, we'll, we'll, we'll accept only a state on, on this, on the 22% of what was originally the army. And then under Oslo, we have the establishment of the Palestinian Authority uh, and, of course, the security coordination with Israel. And that is you know, certainly, certainly one of the key reasons that the PA, now the government of Palestine, it remains extremely unpopular with many, many uh, Palestinians. But I want to, you know, to just, I don't want to get off track too much. I mean, the point is, this is the whole two state solution, this is where it comes from. It comes from the partition resolution. And basically, forced down the throat of the Palestinian people and Oslo. Uh, now the problem with the two-state solution is that basically, and I, and, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself, basically it's just it, it's, it's impossible. It was never before. And I say that because if you look, um, this is a sort of closer up of map of the West Bank, but the red dots are what are euphemistically called in uh, Israeli settlement. Basically they're Israeli colonies. And I have some photographs today, which I hope I'll have time to show you. Um, these are basically Israeli, they're colonies, they're cities. I mean, these are not you know, tent cities or trailer parks. These are cities, you know, <coughs> buildings and schools and all, all this you know, movie cinemas and everything. And they are built, all are built on stone Palestinian land. They're only for Israel. Um, these are openly supported by the Israelis. Uh, I have, you know, I, I, I'm a little bit short of time, so I, don't, I, I can't go into great details of this, all the incentives that they have. But they've been, um, basically, they've been encouraging Israel and Jewish to live. So if you look here, you see that um, within the West Bank, and this is, um, if you look at the map on the right again, you see the green, the green, the green, the bigger green, this is the West Bank, you all know that. But even within, the green part, even within the 22% of 
Palestine that you know, is allegedly going to become a Palestinian state, you have all these Jewish and really only cities completely dominant. I mean, this map is it's a little bit old. So you know, there are more than this. These are just the major ones, really. But these are, this is the extent to which the Israelis have colonized the West Bank. They have, they have built colonies all over. And it's not just you know, near what we always call the Green Line, I believe that's where the 48, um, the 48 ceasefire board, ceasefire line. You know, it's not just right close to what in international circles we are <coughs> real proper. No, this is way, way deeper in the West Bank. You see, it's right along the border of Jordan, and the Israeli government has always been very, very open. You know, we're going to build Israeli colonies. Uh, right near the border as, as, a, as a security precaution. Because these are like security companies. Right? It's, it's all been very clear. So, and, and colonies, even as we speak here and now, they're continuing to expand, continuing to steal Palestinian land. So, you know, the notice that even within the land that's been allotted to Palestine under a two state solution, already you know, unjust, but even, even accepting that, you know, all, if you look over here, there's colonies all over here. And this map is a little bit old. I see this, this graph is a little bit old, but uh, it, it's, it's just getting more and more. So, you know, the, the, you get the idea. Basically, there are 700,000, more than 700,000 Israelis that live in these colonies. That's about 1 in 11, 1 in 12 Jewish Israelis. This, like this is like a normal thing. This is not like, you know, unusual. You have uh, you have ministers, and not just you know in this current sort of extreme right wing Israeli government. No, I mean you've had ministers that live in these colonies, in these places, in these colonies, all built on stolen Palestinian land. Every Israeli company is involved in colonies. Everyone, I mean, utility companies, electricity companies, uh, real estate banks, financing. finance. This is part of the motor that keeps the Israeli economy going. And of course, it's you know it's, it's a war crime. It's, it's international law. But you know, what happened? But you know, the West, you see, in these tepid statements, while the Israelis just go along their merry way, um, doing this kind of stuff. And I have a few pictures, you know, just to give you an idea of what these places look like. These are cities. They're not trailer parks. Um, the Israelis always used to say um, during when quote unquote the peace process going on. You know, they will always say, oh yeah, we will have no problem evacuating the settlement. They call it the settlement. They call it the um, well, we have no problem evacuating the settlements if, you know, if we can have peace and if this land were, uh, were, to, be, were to go to the Palestinians, we'll have no problem evacuating the settlement. You know, this is always a lie. And, you know, it, it's clear that it, that's just not going to happen. These are not built, you know, in any, with any kind of temporariness uh, in mind. These are built as permanent structures, permanent cities. They've got apartment buildings, they've got buildings, houses, schools, cinemas, government offices. One of them has a big university. You know, these, these, are, these are places where nearly you know, three quarters of a million people live. So the idea that these could be somehow evacuated is just, you know, it's really nonsense. There's just no way that it could happen. Um, and if you go to uh, some of these websites, um, you know, this is a website in the UK, but um, you know, they, there's reaching out to Jewish, the Jewish diaspora in all these uh, different countries, saying, why don't you come to Israel and you, you, you have the right to Israeli citizenship, and you, know, you can live in, as we see called it, communities or neighborhoods, as they call it. Right in Judea and Samaria, these are all colonies built on stolen Palestinian land. I mean, all of all of the state of Israel is built on, on stolen Palestinian land. But even accepting to Israel proper part, all of '67, these colonies all built in '67, they are they are all built on stolen Palestinian land. So of course you won't get that in these promotional websites. Um, to add to all of this. Besides the colonies themselves, you have the roads. You have the road net. Now, the Israelis have built a lot of roads. 
uh, of course, with the, uh, with the convenience to the settlers in mind, right? So it, it, this is a very small place. I mean, all of Palestine is, 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 is quite small. I mean, it's, 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 uh, if this means anything, but I believe people often say that it's, it's close, to, it's about the size of New Jersey. It's, it's not a big place, so you know, driving from one end to the other is about three hours, depending on the roads. So, you know, you can like, live in one of these colonies, but actually commute to Tel Aviv or something like that. So the Israelis build these roads. And of course, these roads, they crisscross the West Bank. Um, Palestinians often can't use them, or they're not even allowed to cross these roads at some points. It very much depends. We called it, the, when I was there, we called it the apartheid road network. But the point is that you know, these are all built with the convenience of the settlers in mind. And Palestinians are far from using them in many, in many, in many, in many times, in many places. They're far from crossing them. So these roads that crisscross the West Bank, they also cut up the land, if you see what I'm saying. It's not just the colonies, the dots. You have all these lines connecting these dots, and connecting these dots in places like Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. So basically, this is another factor which is cutting up Palestinian land, making the notion of a state, you know, in the West Bank just just ridiculous. I mean, it's just it's just impossible. Uh, now, uh, throughout, uh, I'm a little bit running out of time here. So you know, throughout the West Bank, you have all these. Obviously, you have the IDF, the Israeli uh, occupation forces, stationed all over the West Bank to protect the settlers. This is what happened. This is what happened, and this is exactly why colonizing, um, colonizing occupied land is against international law. But you have some of these pictures. These pictures are actually not mine; they're taken from the internet. But of uh, the harassment and abuse of Palestinians at the checkpoints. Of course, you've all. I'm sure many of you have seen the wall. Um, this is what it looks like. This is also a picture, but it's, it's snaking through the West Bank. Um, and you know, again, the point here is that it's not along the 48 Green Line. It's not along. It's not along what is supposedly going to be the border between the newly created Palestinian state and Israel. No, as you can see, it departs from the Green Line in many areas, basically swooping in to circle around Israeli colonies, right? So again, it's a land grab. It's grabbing even that much more land um, yeah. uh, for, for the colony, right? Uh, there you go. Um, because we're uh, talking about Jerusalem, just very, very quickly, this is what West Jerusalem looks like. Um, you can see very, uh, very sort of advanced infrastructure. Um, basically, a southern European uh, style level of level of life. This is what East Jerusalem looks like, and, and I didn't just sort of choose the worst pictures. I mean, this is really what it's like. it's basically is a third world slum, say. But um, in terms of infrastructure, in terms of public services, there is no comparison with West Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. This, despite the fact that the Israelis are claiming is Jerusalem, East Jerusalem as well to be part of their capital against international law, completely not acceptable. But they claim it's part of their city. And so East Jerusalemites also have to pay the same tax as West Jerusalem. An Israeli NGO went through the whole budget of Jerusalem and everything, and they calculated that um, East Jerusalemites comprise about, they comprise about like one third of the population. So basically, that's one third of the tax base because everybody pays a sort of flat rate residency tax. Um, but East Jerusalem only gets one tenth of the public service. So you know this the apartheid exists even at that kind of mundane level. The Israelis are uh, have their apartheid system. Um, what I always uh, was amazed by was the garbage. There's no garbage collection. Or it comes, it comes when it comes. You know, in West Jerusalem, you, know, you have garbage collection like in any sort of country at this kind of economic level, three or four times a week or so, you know, the truck comes and they take the garbage away. But in East Jerusalem, it's just, you know, they come when they come, they almost never come. So you have this, there's just mountains and mountains of garbage just being left on the street. 
And in the summer, it gets so bad that they have to, you know, these trucellas, they start burning them because the stench is so terrible. And the, uh, the, the, uh, the, you know, the, the, their health issues by just leaving this garbage in the heat. So, you know, this is the kind of apartheid system that you see. Um, these are, uh, this is a slide about water apartheid and how water is being taken as a resource from the Palestine, from Palestine and used in Israeli colonies over the place on the left. Whereas in East Jerusalem and elsewhere in West Bank, Palestinians are not even connected to the water. So that's just a simple example. I know that I'm in a short of time. So um, in reality, you know, I think people have often, you often see this map as well. Um, in theory, under the two-state solution that we have under Oslo, in theory, if you look at the left map on the left, the green part is supposed to become the independent state of Palestine. In reality, Palestinian land looks more like the right the map on the right hand. Right? So completely disconnected from each other, not contiguous, no way that it could form any kind of sort of viable state. It's just not even possible. Now, like I mentioned before, the evacuation of Israeli colonies, I mean it's like it's not even under, nobody even talks about it. I mean, it's not even under consideration. And nation state law which was uh, a basic law adopted by the Israeli parliament a couple of years ago, even specifically, explicitly states that settlement of the land is a core value of the state of Israel. So there's just this, you know, the notion that these colonies are going to be, the colonization is going to stop, the colonies are going to be, the land is going to be given back to the Palestinians, it's just not going to happen. So um, certainly, I don't know any observer that still honestly believes that the two-state solution is possible. Uh, I mean, there's just no way that this is going to happen. And then people more and more are not, uh, I would say, not even talking about it. But so then what happens if we don't have a two-state solution? What happens? What a lot of people are talking about is the sort of quote unquote one-state solution, um, also called uh, the ODS, the one democratic solution. But um, yeah, so instead of having sort of splitting up this land into two states for two different people, and then we have two sort of exclusive, ethnic, well, at least the, the Jewish part will be an exclusive ethnocratic state, or Palestine will look like a completely different story. But instead of that, what we're looking at is the whole of Palestine becoming one state again for two people. Right? Now this sounds kind of nice, um, and it sounds kind of you know, peace-loving and good, but a lot of work still needs to be done as to what exactly this one-state solution is supposed to look like. Right? Now, um, within Israeli um, you know, there is talk of just annexing the West Bank. So that is, if you like, say one state. I, don't, I wouldn't call it a one-state solution, but it's a one, it becomes so it all becomes part of Israel. I think anybody you know, wants wants that. And so any 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 anybody who believes in you know, the human rights of Palestinians thinks I don't think anybody would think that that is going to be a viable solution. And even within you know the Israeli discourse, the people this for a long time this was even sort of a taboo because they're thinking, okay, well we annex that, but what do we do with the Palestinians? I mean, should we give them the right to vote? Oh, but if we give them the right to vote, then you know we, we cease to become uh, a Jewish state because they'll sooner or later they'll outvote us because you know soon they will they have more children and you know, sooner or later they're they're going to have they're doing more than they will outvote us. So then we can't give them the right to vote. Oh, but then oh, but you know Israel was supposed to be a, a democratic state, a Jewish and democratic state. So in order to preserve the Jewish and democratic character of Israel, we can't go forward with this annexation because it gives you know we're, we're stuck in this conundrum. Now, you know, the mere fact that this debate even takes place is, is really it just it's just unbelievable. I mean, we're gonna, uh, first of all, we're going to annex this land um, against completely against international law. Uh, but but the people, oh, we're going to give them the right to vote. I mean, oh, we don't want to do that. 
And you know, the Americans and, and the Europeans, they wring their hands and say, oh, but that's not good because of the Jewish and democratic state. I mean, you know, what's going on here? You know, if, if you have people under your rule, they should have the right to vote. Oh, this is pretty simple. But uh, the, you know, the notion that to remain Jewish and democratic, Israel has to exclude the Palestinians under its rule for having any kind of civil rights. It's just like, it's, this isn't taken for granted. It's taken for granted within the, the Israeli discourse and within a lot of the discourse in the West. So this is this kind of sort of conundrum that you see with, uh, with the whole one state paradigm. And then you see, uh, like, uh, you see a lot of, like, for example, particular Americans who say, oh yeah, so it all becomes one state, like, like you know, it all becomes one state, Israel or whatever you call it, but, um, you know, then the Palestinian struggle ceases to become a national sort of struggle for their own state, and it becomes more of a civil rights struggle, like, with it, like, you know, with, like the black people, the African American people of the United States. You know, I just love how you know Americans and you know, the West in general, they think, oh yeah, we have a solution. We, we tell you what to do. Uh, you know, we know what's best, and we're just going to tell you what to do. Uh, so why don't you just give up all your aspirations for national self-determination, and you can become citizens of Israel and civil rights struggle. I think that's a great idea. Well, I don't think that's a great idea. And I don't know why, you know, I, I don't know too many Palestinians who think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think some of them might. But it's, it's you know, it, it, it's, it's, it completely bypasses the whole fundamental right that the Palestinian people have of national self-determination. So then, you know, there's also talk about having like a binational confederation. It's all very sort of airy fair, you know? And, and, you know, so it's basically, it's another sort of two states. It's one state, but it's like two autonomous regions, um, basically along the lines that we have now. And that, you know, I'm not sure how that's actually supposed to work, and nobody has any kind of specific outline here. But it, again, that doesn't you know, deal with the issue of the colonies, which I uh, showed you earlier. You, know, you have all these colonies living in what, under any, what would presumably be the Palestinian part of the state. So well, what happens here? You know, all, what happens to all that land that was stolen from, these, from Palestinian people and all their residents? Well, what happens to them and what happens to these people? It's all very sort of murky and unclear, and that's okay. Uh, up to a point, but uh, my point here is that it's still, you know, a lot of work needs to be done, really, to what some kind of one state solution will look like. And, you know, there are researchers and scholars who are doing this kind of thinking, but it's, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's still a ways to go. And as a human rights uh, lawyer, what I would just want to stress is that we need any kind of solution, two state ones or whatever, it has to address the injustices that are taking place up to now, are taking place even now. There has to be accountability for the past violations. You know, the, that is one of the big human rights problems in uh, Palestine. You know, Israeli soldiers, they shoot Palestinians uh, peacefully demonstrating. What happens then? Nothing. Israeli colonizers, you know, they burn down olive trees, beat Palestinians up, shoot them. What happens then? Nothing. And this is the, you know, this is, uh, Israeli politicians, they push forward the colonization of Palestine, stealing Palestine. What happened? Nothing. So, you know, this is the impunity that is uh, one of the core problems, one of the core human rights problems in Palestine. And for there to be any kind of viable solution, any kind of viable peace, then that really needs to be addressed, you know, for, uh, first and foremost. That really needs to be addressed in a proper way. So I think I've uh, probably gone over my time, but just a little bit. And uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to you. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Son, uh, for that very eye opening presentation. Uh, I think there's a lot of information there that we can uh, take back. Uh, so now I open the floor to any questions that anyone might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if I'm having these technical sort of issues here. Uh, uh, <coughs> 
Yeah, but maybe you see me, okay? Ah, okay. Dr. Takashi, uh, Ohayo Kusanas. Thank you very much for your very clear uh, presentation. Uh, but it's just, like you said, uh, the solution is almost impossible. And uh, it's a very glam uh, picture that you have painted, almost fait accompli. Almost fait accompli. I mean, with the US uh, backing any Israeli government. And, uh, and uh, the Israeli government very blatantly saying to the US right in the face, you take it or leave it, you better support us. You know, I saw, uh, I saw a video many, many years ago that Hillary Clinton, uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, Hillary Clinton was, uh, was uh, she, she was facing the Israeli, some Israeli officials, the Israeli officials said, like, uh, you take it or leave it, uh, you have to support us. So it, it's really a glam picture. So uh, I really uh, am with you that, uh, that uh, we have to focus on the injustice. And your last word there was accountability. So my question is, accountable to who? Who do we make them accountable to? Because the international community uh, doesn't seem to pay much attention to what the atrocities of Israeli, of what Israelis are doing there. So my question, uh, I'm trying to understand uh, accountable to who. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Takeshi. By the way, my name is Shukri. <laughs> Uh, thank you. I, there's some technical problems. I did understand the question. Uh, now I can't see you anymore. But um, I, I guess I, I hope you can. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're yeah, yeah, very good. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Okay. Well, I can't see you, but that's okay. Um, no, thank you. And that's a, uh, thank you very much for for pointing that out. I think that's a very very good point. Um, uh, what's happening, of course, now? Um, I, I guess what, what I would say, I guess two, two sort of components to what, what, I, what I'd like to say. Um, what's happening now and perhaps what could happen in the future. What's happening now is the international community, uh, so to speak, is there have been movements towards uh, criminal prosecutions of uh, Israeli war criminals and uh, people who have committed crimes against humanity. Um, there had been movement towards that, in particular I'm thinking of the International Criminal Court. Now, uh, they have started their uh, investigation, they, they, they've announced that they're doing it. And so, you know, at a certain point, a lot of human rights people were very excited, and I was very excited. Um, it seems to have sort of got a little bit bogged down. Uh, I don't. Yeah, I don't have any inside information about that. But it just, you know, nothing has happened for a number of years, and that's very, very concerning. Especially, of course, when we look at the, you know, the blatant double standards with Ukraine. I think within a couple of weeks, the ICC announced that it was looking at potential war crimes in in, the, in Ukraine. So, you know, right, rightfully so in, in terms of the Ukraine. But um, you know, what's happening in Palestine also deserves uh, the, the equal attention, for sure, of the ICC. But, you know, it, it, there, is, there is movement. And I think that as, uh, as advocates, we should continue pushing for that. Because it is something that, you know, Israeli military and political leaders are afraid of. I mean, I, 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 uh, I am realistic about a lot of these international structures, but at the same time, you know, I don't want to sound too cynical either. I mean, dictators all over the world, they wake up in the middle of the night screaming and sweating at the prospect of being hauled to the hate. I mean, they do. I, I don't know if it's for a fact, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure they do. Because they are afraid. They know that they are doing the wrong thing. They're doing wrong things. They are afraid of being held to account. The Israeli army has a special unit of lawyers that is to be sent, you know, urgently to any, for example, European country, in the case that any Israeli soldier or officer that is traveling abroad, in case that they are, in case that they are arrested and put on trial for war crimes. 
So they know this could happen. They know that this is a possibility, and they're trying to prepare for it. But you know, the writing is on. Now, as far as a one-state solution goes, I, I think you know every uh, post-conflict situation, country situation, has uh, in recent years created some sort of uh, mechanism for uh, addressing accountability issues during conflict or during the kind of period where widespread human rights violations have taken place. South Africa is, of course, very well known. The truth commissions that were operating in South Africa, you know, that went on, that they've been well researched. And there are a lot of issues with them. I mean, you know, they, they, the general consensus is that they, there's a lot of room for improvement. Uh, and then it's, you know, other countries have done different things, and there special tribunals. Uh, some of them have worked well, and some of them have worked a little bit less well. But the point is that at a certain point, you know, Israeli violators have to be held to account um, to or by Pal the Palestinians. You know, it's the Palestinians who, whose rights they have violated. So I certainly do hope that in any kind of one state solution, which may take place in the future, that there are adequate mechanisms that they are held to account by the Palestinian people themselves. Um, I, I can't, you know, I don't have a specific picture of what exactly that would look like. But I think, you know, international justice can only go so far, and it always has its limits. And at the end of the day, it will have to be something that is um, that that is done and run, you know, conceptualized and run by the victims themselves. So that means by the Palestinian people. And I certainly, inshallah, hope that it will it will happen in our lifetimes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if anybody's talking. I'm afraid I, I can't hear anything. Okay. Uh, so now I go on a blind. Ah, okay. 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 So, okay. Alhamdulillah. It's very good and refreshing uh, lecture on your part, uh, Professor Saul. I just want to share with you my personal experience the, as being the victim of Zionism. When I was studying my PhD in one of the universities in the uh, USA, my supervisor, being the Zionist sympathizer, she asked me, what do you mean by S-A-N-A-T-M-D, Nasir, the M-D. The M-D, when I told her, the M-D stands for Muhammad, automatically, he says you better go back to your home country. Uh, that's being the victim. Uh, so, we have this Zionism all over the places. And the so-called United Nations happen to be using the stand, uh, double standards all over. I think we don't have to trust them. What we need is for the first and ever step the PLO must stand for its own liberations, not to cooperate with them as they are buying time. They want to buy, they want to obliterate the land and they want to control the Palestinian. So, no trust to them and we trust ourselves and trust in Allah and we have to be united in the Muslims and the humanitarian uh, people who have the vision of non-violence should cooperate and hope, inshallah, we will succeed in this endeavor. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, thank you. I, I, I certainly do. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly agree. I, I didn't hear every single word of what you said, unfortunately, but um, uh, for sure, uh, it's it's important to uh, always focus on what's really happening and you know, the victimization and the abuses that Palestinian people face on a daily basis um, is really just uh, appalling. And uh, you know, the whole there's been, I think. A lot of people have, have realized 
Um, also, you know, amongst the Palestinian population, but some outside researchers and all that. I just realized what a what a sham the Oslo process has turned out to be. You know, it, it might be it might be that that was the intention all along. I, sure. I I'm, I'm not sure about that, but you know, what what has happened is that it has just bought time for the Israelis to continue on with their colonization of his uh, Palestinian land, stealing Palestinian land, driving Palestinians off it. And, uh, you know, with the cover of the so-called peace process, which was never, which was never going anywhere. Uh, um, and, uh, yeah, certainly with the support of uh, the United States in particular, and Western Europeans as well, you know, this has been going on for just far too long. And, uh, you know, when I was in Palestine, a lot of Palestinians used to tell me that the third intifada would take place against the PA. Um, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, you know, maybe, maybe that will be the case, but it's just, uh, yeah. I, as as a UN as a UN officer, of course, also we also were looking at uh, violations that were uh, committed by uh, the PA as well, and um, you know, it was very, very just. Shocking, sad to see uh, Palestinians, you know, Palestinian PA police arresting other Palestinians at the behest of the Israelis and you know torturing them. Uh, you know it was it was just just appalling. And what was I mean, one of the stories that I used to hear? I heard this quite often. And later on, I think I'll have to write about it. But anyway, um, I, I, I've interviewed the Palestinian, um, for example, party members of non fatah parties uh, who had been arrested and tortured by the PA police. And they would say that the you know, policemen, as they were torturing them, they would start speaking Hebrew. And this was, you know, it's just such a shocking thing. I mean, just like, you know, so for this, Cop. Hebrew was a language of torture, if you will. Well, that might be because he himself had been tortured by the Israelis, or it might be because he had been trained in torture by the Israelis. I don't really know, but it, it, it's, it's a very sort of shocking insight into what's going on. And, um, you know, certainly the dissatisfaction that a lot of uh, a lot of Palestinians feel with the, with the PA is, is, is you know, I can certainly understand. I mean, if I were if I were Palestinian, I'd be very upset too. Um, so you know, all of this, every colonizer in in the in certainly modern history has done this. They've created a sort of government of quizzes and traders that do the bidding uh, do the bidding of the colonizers. Uh, for them. So, you know, this is uh, an obstacle. But I think a lot of people see just how the whole Oslo process is, 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 is a sham. It's become a sham. It's falling apart. And it's just not viable. You know, we have to see what happens. Um, but certainly, uh, I am a human rights uh, guy, and, and I do believe, inshallah, that, uh, you know, justice will triumph in the end. In the end, inshallah, uh, there will be. Justice in Palestine. Okay, uh, I think uh, with that, uh, we have come to the end of the session. We thank Dr. Saul Takahashi, uh, and we hope to, in future, to see you in person here in Malaysia for uh, future programs. Yes. Uh, and with that, we would like to end the program uh, with Tasbih uh, Kafara and Surah Hanas. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Uh, okay. And lunch. Thank you. Lunch is served. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped. So, can I say Yeah? Last word. 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 Last word.
No, it's just 30 minutes. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> I think uh, terima kasih banyak uh, kepada semua uh, hadir, uh, hadirin pada hadirin dan hadirat hari ini uh, yang dirahmati Allah SWT. Uh, what we had here was a series of panelists uh, that I think is world class on the issue